Okay. Um, let me hand it off then to Chris Joyce of National Public Radio. Uh, everybody's been introduced with slides. Their bios are in the program. So, uh, Chris, you may just mention people's names as you do the first question, but uh, otherwise, uh, introductions are passed. Uh, please, if people can uh, take their conversations outside, we appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, Brian. Okay, we're going to keep moving. Thank you so much for coming. Um, fun so far, and I appreciate my colleague Richard Harris warming up the crowd for us. Um, I'm Chris Joyce from National Public Radio. Um, I know that these people have uh, been introduced by slide, but I don't think that's quite fair enough. So let me say, Ellen Williams, who's director of ARPA-E, and you can go to the slide to find out what ARPA-E is. Uh, Julio Friedman from the Department of Energy. He is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate Change and Carbon Management, and carbon is our topic today. So. Glad you're here. Mark Jacobson at Stanford University, senior fellow with the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. And Dan Arvizu, National Renewable Energy Lab, the director, who's been bringing uh, alternative energy to America for decades. And Cheryl Roberto, who is assistant vice president for clean energy at the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and so, decarbonization. Now, if you're here to find out how to get the carbon out of the cylinders on your car, you're in the wrong room. Um, this, that's down the hall. Uh, th this is the, uh, the notion that we're going to take carbon out of our energy economy. Um, carbon has been our friend for centuries. Now it's more like the, the, uh, the business partner that emptied your bank account and, and ran to Venezuela. Um, we want to change the way that we've been making energy for hundreds of years, and we want to change it fast, and that's not easy. And we have some of the world's experts uh, on just how to do that. Um, and so we'll get right to that. I want to, um, I mean, I'd like to add, one, and these, these conferences, I, you know, I, having been a journalist in Washington for a long time, I've been to many conferences like this. It is a bit like preaching to the converted folks. So uh, just as a thought experiment or a little in incentivizing, let's just imagine that this is the annual meeting of the US Chamber of Commerce, okay? And you, these people are skeptical. That, that side's the Chamber of Commerce. That is the uh, American Coal Association. So, so these people are skeptical, and you have to convince them. And if you can't convince, you can convince me too. Um, so carbon dioxide, coal is the biggest source, of course, uh, for the carbon, which is in, in turn the biggest source of uh, greenhouse gas forcing. So I thought I'd start with Ellen from ARPA. Um, and to talk a bit, we're going to talk about coal, I hope, and about um, the notion of clean coal, the notion that we can have our cake and eat it too. So what are you going to do to make us, to allow us to do that? Well, great. Thanks for that introduction. It's, a, uh, it's quite a challenge. So what I'd like to do to emphasize in my comments today is the absolute importance of improving our technical means for reducing carbon at the same time that we make our low carbon technologies economically attractive. A little higher. Make our low carbon technologies economically attractive. In that way, they will get built into our energy infrastructure and will drive change the most rapidly. So from ARPA-E's perspective, this is a perfect mission. ARPA-E is tasked to drive disruptive energy technologies with three goals. One is to reduce emissions, including green ga greenhouse gas emissions. One is to improve energy efficiency, which also has good implications for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the third is to reduce our dependence on foreign energy imports. And all of these are to be done in the context of improving the U.S. economy. So as we look at this um, and work towards those goals, one of RBE's key mechanisms is to, as we identify potentially disruptive technologies, drive them forward also with a very keen eye to making them economically attractive so that they can compete with incumbent technologies. And this is really important for decarbonization because we have a huge established infrastructure that we have to deal with. So what I'd like to do is quickly tell you about one of our programs, which has to do with carbon capture, in particular carbon capture from power plants that burn fossil fuels, including coal, to produce electrical power. Uh, uh, DARPA-E started about uh, 2010 looking for disruptive 
technology opportunities in the space of carbon capture, really with the intention of driving down the cost structure. And we did a broad survey across a variety of technologies, and we identified many different possibilities, wildly different technical approaches to reducing the uh, carbon output and uh, capturing the carbon from power plants. But all of them were very early stage, very high risk technologies, very hard to judge which if any of those was going to be commercially viable. So to deal with this, what we did was to select 20 across a spectrum of, uh, of technologies, and we drove them really hard against strong technical milestones and t- strong commercial milestones to see what, about their performance and their ability to be competitive. And we found that they're doing extremely well. We've had at least six of them picked up for continuing funding through DOE's fossil energy programs, including DOE's core carbon capture utilization and storage program. And one of those technologies has been already moved forward to the point that it can be scaled up to a pilot demonstration plant. And it is showing that it can not only drive down the cost of capturing carbon from power production by at least a factor of two, if not more, but it's also hands down beating our uh, metric for uh, capturing at least 90% of the CO2 emissions. So these results have basically de-risked this technology and many of the other technologies that we initially invested in, making it possible for the commercial sector to come in and start investing and start moving these things forward into our active energy infrastructure. So that's a key part of the message, which is not only do we have to know how to do it, but we have to build it into our, our infrastructure, and we have to do that by making it economically attractive and economically competitive. So carbon capture is just one of our programs. We have uh, we look across the energy sector, and we're applying the same approach all across the energy sector, not just in the obvious things about energy supply, but energy efficiency, advanced manufacturing. In all of these areas, there's big opportunities for disruptive technologies to come in and get built into the infrastructure for the future. I'll ask a, a quick question before we move on. Uh, we have worked, and DOE in, in, indeed has worked on, on carbon capture before, future gen and, and many other projects, yes. which actually sort of went down. Um, why has it been so difficult to get this ball rolling? I mean, the technology isn't all that new. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll so get that's, to that then. So that's Julio's oh, topic. Pa- so you're going to pass that off. Yeah. But I'll say one thing that RPE is supposed to do is look at the alternatives, the off-road map, the new opportunities that might change the game. We heard a little, some words about leapfrogging in the last session. We're looking for some opportunities also to leapfrog. When they look promising, we hand them off to Julio, who makes them real. Okay. Okay, Julio. And say what you need to say, but I think that we, if we can get to that question at some point. So I'm happy to talk about this, one of my favorite topics, and thank you again for inviting me and being here. I actually brought a few slides which actually show pictures of the operating plants around the world, which in part addresses your question. If we could go to the slides just super quickly. Um, There's a couple of high-level points I want to make. Uh, The first of all is, like it or not, we are in an era of fossil energy abundance. Uh, We are, in fact, using more coal than we ever have before. We are, in fact, producing more gas and more oil than we ever have before. In fact, Saudi Arabia now considers us to be the global swing producer, uh, and in fact, we will exceed production for oil and gas uh, around the world very, very soon. Actually, this is a great news story, except for one inconvenient truth, uh, which is, in fact, uh, we are now well above the worst-case scenario for the IPCC back in 2001, uh, and in fact, uh, the emissions uh, continue unabated, and and this is not lost on this crowd or or others. Uh, Fossil energy provides a lot of benefit, but this is not one of them. We actually have to be serious about the title of this session, decarbonizing the energy sector. Uh, Decarbonizing doesn't mean defossilizing. It means decarbonizing. And one of the things you can do is carbon capture and storage. The IPCC, the IEA, MIT, YASA, EPRI, many, many groups come to the same conclusion. You need that as part of the solution. You need renewables. You need efficiency. But you also need CCS. And that's central to the President's Climate Action Plan. It is, it is in fact, formally part of the the all-of-the-above solution because, in fact, in some markets, this will be the cheapest thing. Not in every market, 
but in some markets, CCS will be the cheapest solution. Uh, this was formally presented, actually, by the IPCC, and, and I want to dwell on this for just a moment. If you take CCS off the table, half of the model runs do not reach a 450 stabilization scenario. I'll say that again. If you take CCS off the table, half of the solutions don't converge on a 450 stabilization scenario. Uh, and in fact, if you take CCS off the table, the cost of hitting that target for the ones that do converge more than doubles, increases 138%. And that's the conservative estimate. If you look at Dan, uh, sorry, David Victor's uh, assessment from, from UC San Diego, to hit a 450 stabilization scenario, you basically triple or quadruple the cost of hitting that same target. And this is one of those things, because for many parts of the economy, this is the one that's the cheapest option. If you take it off, you have to replace it with something more expensive. This was the case in Canada, and here is a fully operational post-combustion capture retrofit power plant, the Boundary Dam project. It is currently capturing 1.1 million tons of CO2. It's doing so just fine. It became operational in October, and if you look at the smoke coming out the top, that's showing you, in fact, that it's not smoke, that's steam that's being used to capture and regenerate the CO2. Uh, and there's a pipeline at the other end that's putting that underground indefinitely. Uh, we've had a 17-year program on carbon capture and storage at the DOE. One of the things we know is that storage works, and one of the things we know is we can continue to ratchet down the cost for this technology. We've had a number of other successes in the U.S. This is the Port Arthur project, 1.1 million tons of CO2 per year. It's about to hit 2 million tons in April. CO2 that was going in the air from a refinery, now going underground. We're about to launch, actually, uh, the same kind of project at a biorefinery in Illinois. That's going to start injecting a million tons of CO2. We'll talk about that this afternoon in our session. This is a completely different kinds of project, new build plant, not a retrofit in Mississippi. Uh, this is coming online probably in early 2016. 2.7 million tons of CO2 for a 580 megawatt power plant. This is not shucking and jiving. This is a real project and will, in fact, deliver the lowest carbon footprint energy anywhere in the world until this plant comes into operation the next year. Uh, this is a retrofit of a Texas power plant like Boundary Dam. This is going to capture and store 1.4 million tons of carbon dioxide every year, 240 megawatt power plant. It will be operational summer of 2016. So, in fact, this is not some when will it be ready, what, you know, what's going on. These are operational today or they're in construction today. There's actually 12 projects around the world that are fully operational, 20 that will be operational by the end of this decade. And I want to stress a point re relative to your question, Christopher, which is these projects are hard. All of these projects are hard. You're taking something that hasn't been done and you're doing it. That's actually something a bank won't finance on its own. That's exactly why there's a federal role in trying to stand these projects up. But they're all hard. We have another four projects on our books which have not quite gotten there yet. And we're doing our level best to get them all up. But we sh should, in fact, expect that this is uh, righteous work but difficult work and part of what makes, uh, uh, in fact, uh, our federal investments well worth its time. Thank you. Uh, Julio, let me ask you a, a question then to follow on that, uh, and if you can be fairly brief to answer it. Um, great technology, theoretically wonderful. If this goes operational and you've got dozens if not hundreds of these, what do you do with the CO2? Where do you put it and how do you get it there? So with, do you need to build a vast new pipeline system to carry all the CO2 around the country? Right. So it's nice to know there's a rich, deep literature on all these topics, and I encourage you to look into that on your own time. Short answers are, first of all, we know where to put it. We are in the fourth generation of our atlas at the DOE, showing where there are CO2 storage sites around North America. This next volume is just out. It includes Mexico as well as Canada and the U.S. Our conservative estimate is 2,200 billion tons of storage in North America. Plenty of space. And it's widely disturbed, being distributed, broadly speaking, where coal plants are. So what we're talking about here is not vast networks, but instead regional networks that connect the point sources to the regional sinks. Uh, uh, PNNL, again, our net good partners at the National Labs, published an estimate. They think nationally you need about 20,000 miles of pipeline to get most of it. 20,000 miles of pipeline is more than the 5,000 miles we have today. But we actually have 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines today. They've been operating since the 70s. They're managed by the Department of Transportation. Uh, and in fact, they work just fine. 
And also 20,000 is way less, way less, an order of magnitude less than the natural gas pipeline infrastructure. So it's not a stretch. We know that this is in bounds. It's actually more a question of financing than anything else. Thanks very much. Um, let's move on to Mark, because um, uh, Mark Jacobson, uh, you've written that you suggest that all new energy sources starting in 2020 or by in 2020 be wind, water, and sunlight. So I would suspect that you're not behind the clean coal idea. <laughs> no. Like, and can I, you tell us why? Sure. Um, I have some slides, too, if we can put them up. Um, yeah, so our, we've been developing plans to change the energy infrastructure of each of the 50 United States, and actually we all of the world to go entirely to wind, water, and solar power for all purposes, including, um, including electricity, transportation, heating, cooling, and industry. And this does not involve any uh, clean coal, no natural gas, no biofuels, no nuclear power, um, only clean renewable energy that will eliminate four to seven million air pollution deaths per year prematurely and eliminate global warming, provide jobs, and create energy stability and energy price stability. So in terms of electricity, we would use Actually, let me go backwards here. We'd use for electricity, wind, solar, uh, PV, and concentrated solar power, geothermal power, hydroelectric, and tidal wave power. For transportation, we'd use these electric power sources to provide electricity for battery electric vehicles, some hydrogen fuel cell vehicles for uh, long-distance trucks, for example, uh, some cryogenic hydrogen, a small amount. Um, heating, cooling, all on electric heat pumps, uh, electric resistance, heating, and solar uh, heating collectors for underground storage. Uh, industry, all electric as well. For storage, uh, we would use for electricity concentrated solar power with phase change material for storage, pumped hydro existing, and some new planned pumped hydro, but not a lot, and existing hydroelectric. That's all. For heating and cooling, sensible heat storage for heating and cooling and ice storage and soil storage. And also some hydrogen, again, for transportation, that would be, uh, you can store it, and demand response management. And just to, um, this would be, we, we developed plans for each of the 50 United States, and this is the sum of all the plans, all the land area that would be needed to power the entire U.S. for all purposes, uh, replacing all fossil fuels, biofuels, and nuclear power. And this, we'd first of all reduce power demand in the U.S. by about uh, 37 percent, and this by 2050, accounting for increases in demand up to 2050. About six percentage points of that is end-use energy efficiency, and the rest is just the efficiency of electricity over combustion because you just waste a lot of energy with combustion. It's just inefficient. The land use is less than uh, half a percent of the U.S. land for footprint area and another 2 percent for spacing, mostly for onshore wind, but you can use that space for multiple purposes, uh, such as uh, agriculture, farming, and rangeland and open space. And there's some uh, – wind would supply about half of all U.S. energy. Solar is about 40 percent of all U.S. energy, 45 percent, and the rest are the tiny amounts of uh, existing hydroelectric who would not grow hydro and uh, small amounts of geothermal and a small amount of tidal and wave power. Uh, we've done grid reliability studies. We can now say that we can power the entire U.S. for all purposes, 100 percent reliable. We've done simulations. Uh, for the whole U.S., every single state of the U.S. combined over the U.S., and without any loss of load over six years, uh, we modeled the winds accounting for the uh, over 400,000 wind turbines that would the uh, the com competition among turbines for limited kinetic energy in the winds, the extraction of solar energy, the feedbacks of this to climate, and then by combining all this with uh, with solar and all the other energy sources and all the storage as I listed, uh, we can now match the loads. This shows six years of load. The red line on the top is uh, the actual load, the actual power supply from wind, water, solar. The blue dots are the demand. We match it exactly month. This is month by month. Here are some individual days. Every single hour of every single day for six years, we can do it. So there's no more uh, argument that you you will have. Uh, non-reliable grid. And we do this at about 10.4 cents a kilowatt hour for the whole system. That's in 2050 costs. So it's a low cost, completely 100 percent reliable system. Here's another four days in January. The other was July. Um, here's the timeline to go to 2050. If we don't do anything with it, we're at the top line where you go, it's business as usual. We'll increase our power demand and pollution. Uh, if we convert uh, we try to get 80 percent by 2030 and 100 percent by 2050, uh, but the, that 100 percent line is if we convert to electricity, then we get, as I said, about 30 percent uh, energy efficiency improvements just by electricity uh, efficiency, another 6 to 7 percent by end-use energy efficiency improvements, and the rest is developed by wind, water, and solar. And I should say we proposed this to uh, California's Governor Brown in October. 
And in January, he stated in the State of the Union address, he'll, he's adopting 60% of our plan, so he wants to go 50% wind, water, solar by 2030. In New York, uh, Governor Cuomo has also adopted three of our proposed first steps, and he's also banned fracking, which was only possible because we had a plan for uh, wind, water, solar. Uh, so to summarize... Converting the U.S. to 100% wind, water, solar, we'd, use, we'd reduce demand by 37% just due to efficiency and a small amount of end-use energy efficiency improvements. We'd re- eliminate 63,000 U.S. air pollution premature deaths, which is about 3% of the GDP, eliminate about $730 million, billion dollars per year of global climate costs from U.S. emissions. We'd create about 5 million 40-year construction jobs, 2.4 million 40-year operation jobs. It'd cost about 3.9 million uh, fossil and nuclear jobs. We'd require only about 0.44% of U.S. land area for footprint, 1.7 percent for spacing. Uh, wind, water, solar with storage and demand response management, we can get 100 percent reliability, about 10 to 11 cents a kilowatt hour. hour. There are barriers, including upfront costs, transmission needs, lobbying, and politics. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, please see the 100.org. And there's a website that has all these energy plans, and uh, we'll be able to talk about it more. I don't think I've ever heard so much data in five minutes in my life. You've got a future in commercial radio advertising. Believe me, you could <laughs> come, come and see us at NPR. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> but it could be. <laughs> you never know. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll get to – obviously, there's lots of questions that, that, that you're posing um, that would come with what you were suggesting. So, But we'll get to them, but I want to move on. Um, to talk to, to Dan about uh, NREL because part a lot of what NREL has been doing is trying to develop, if I understand it correctly, you know, the infrastructure that can support renewable technologies of the kind that you're talking about. But you, you take it away. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so I actually followed instructions, and I don't have any slides. Um, but, but I do have things it's not to, too late. <laughs> but I do have things to say regarding uh, both of my uh, two uh, colleagues here on the panel. And uh, first of all, thanks for, for inviting us and for being part of it. I, I, one thing that I can say is I've only been in this business about 40 years. So I have watched lots of cycles. I have seen lots of, of, of uh, aspirational goals uh, get put in place. And then I have watched what it takes to actually make that happen. And what I can say is where the rubber hits the road is down at the grassroots, and it's very, very challenging, very, very difficult. So much of what is being said, I think, uh, has merit from a technical standpoint, but from a practical standpoint, it's much more challenging, much more difficult. So as I, I've evolved my own thinking and, and, and recognize I'm the director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, so when I walk into some uh, elected official's office, the first thing that they uh, expect is that I'm an advocate for renewable energy. Well, uh, in, 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 uh, I, am, I am, in fact, one of those, but I'm a passive activist in, this, in the following way. What we really want is an energy system that has a set of attributes that we can all subscribe to whether you're independent of your political persuasion, independent of your technology of choice. And, and just a list of those attributes would be affordable, safe, accessible, reliable, low carbon, energy, and clean, secure, resilient, adaptable, flexible, and an engine for innovation. If we had all of those things, I think everyone in the room, uh, independent of persuasion, and if you don't like all those, then add your own. But I think that ultimately is the, is the challenge. How do we get to that kind of a system which today's energy system does not provide? Today's energy system is clearly not sustainable. It clearly is aging. It clearly does not meet the needs of the future. So at the lab, what we've looked at is, you know, what can we aspire to in terms of renewable energy? And again, if you, if you look at it from the perspective of I don't really care what technology gets me there, if I can get there, that's, that's a home run. That's, that's really, really what we would like to achieve. Now, I happen to believe that renewable energy can provide a great deal of that solution for us. And where I may be not an advocate of 100%, uh, like Mark might be, uh, I, I do think that we can do a whole lot more than what we're doing now. And, in fact, if you look at all the studies that, that, we, that certainly that I've been a part of, that many of our colleagues at, at NREL have been a part of, the IPCC solar, uh, the, um, the special report on renewable energy, the global energy assessment, the GEA, uh, the, the REFs, the, the, the Renewable Electricity, Electricity Future Study, which was uh, made up of 35 organizations, 110 authors, all give you the same conclusions. It's possible. We can do it. It, it is a matter of, of, 
uh, both will and 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 uh, focus on making that outcome happen. So as we look at that, one of the things that I've been focused on recently is this idea that we need to think differently about our future energy system. And that has one that is what I'm going to call distributed generation meets central station. So much of what, of what uh, Julio talked about in terms of central station, in fact, may be accurate if you have a mindset that is very focused on central station. But in fact, central station may be different in different parts of the world. And in the emerging economies, they may start with distributed generation and add a little bit of central station. Where in this country, we start with central station and we, and we you know, begrudgingly put in distributed generation. Over the long haul, distributed generation and, and, and central station are kind of at a conflict. And there will be a balance, different place for different regions. And, and actually, uh, it will evolve over time. It's complex. It requires that we think about the resources. It requires that we think about the public uh, will to, to actually uh, get to the achievable uh, outcomes that we're looking for. And ultimately, it really is about how do we optimize the system based on a whole new set of trends new uh, power electronics, new data analytics and massive control opportunities, two-way power flow, a variety of things where the consumer is no longer just the receiver of electrons, but in fact maybe the generator of electrons. And as, as such, you start with efficiency, you start with distributed generation, and you can demonstrate that in, that in a future state, it could be that you, you have microgrids that are networked together and the utilities that are cre- presently the central station providers today are the energy service providers of the future. So those are all, I think, on the table. And if you think about the world in that perspective, you get to a whole different set of options about how renewables play, and they could be easily, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent of our overall future uh, energy um, uh, supply for what ultimately is a, a set of, of very efficient and, and uh, disruptive types of technologies for the future. I'll okay, stop there and we'll ask more questions. Okay, and, and we'll get to questions on that, I'm sure. Um, Cheryl, um, before going to the Environmental Defense Fund, you were with the Public Utilities Commission in Ohio, if I have that correct. And so you, know, you certainly know the perspective of the people who have to provide electricity every single day, <clears throat> no matter what. Um, maybe you can enlighten us a bit about getting the utility world on board in, in, in this whole enterprise. Yes, thank you. And I am really happy to be part of this panel because I think it knits together really perfectly. As we've just talked about, we have central station, we have distributed generation, we have newly engaged consumers who now can be part of the energy mix. The challenge is balancing power, using what you have generated at the exact same time that you need it. Um, Where does energy efficiency fit in? Where do renewables fit in? Sure, these are technological challenges, but it's pragmatic and policy that stand in the greatest barrier at this point in time. We have great potential to bring renewables and energy efficiency to much greater scale than we are right now. And what stays in the way, what stands in the way, is that we haven't developed the intersection between customers and their energy needs that we need. And what what we propose to do is uh, build on this two-way energy system that should exist but doesn't. Um, We believe the place to look to do that is with the utility. Instead of the utility being the provider of electrons going just one direction, uh, we want to see the utility provider being the portal, the creator of the marketplace, the platform upon which all of these energy services can play. Uh, As a consumer, whether you're a residential consumer, commercial, or a business consumer, uh, industrial consumer, right now you have to go out and find what your energy services need if they don't show up as an electron at the end of your plug. That's not the way to really innovate in this marketplace. If you think in terms of uh, eBay or Amazon, it's a one-stop shop for fungible services. To meet our needs, we need that same type of uh, ability to find the various services and be able to contribute to those services as well. Now, we, we think that means that the utilities need to be modified. We need to rethink what we need from our utilities. In the first instance, to do that, um, utilities should be rewarded for providing this kind of platform. 
we need them to produce or provide a grid that's far more resilient and less wasteful than it is. We need to have an economic system that prices both what's provided from the platform itself and from the energy and what we as individual consumers can contribute, whether it's electrons from the solar panel on our roof or if it's by choosing to use electricity in a different time because that helps shape the load and enables us to use more of the renewable energy that, that comes in peaks. Um, or, or whether we need to unleash the private capital. You know, you said we're starting out talking to the Chamber of Commerce on this side. This message may not reson re uh, resonate as well with the, the coal producers, but we're talking about markets. We're, we're talking about individual consumers making choices about what meets their needs first and best and most cost effectively. The technology exists, we need to unlock it by shaping up our regulations and our market rules to unleash it. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you. I think that we should give these people a round of applause for, <laughs> for trying to make clear what you know occupies them, you know, twelve hours a day, five days a week for most of their careers. Uh, seven days a week in your case. Um, <laughs> I'll ask one question, then, and I'll, I'll go to this. And we, we talked, everybody mentioned, or just about everybody mentioned, disruptive technology or disruptive thinking, if you will. Um, some of these technologies are not here yet. Many are available. Um, we can call them disruptive. One of the things that has disrupted our energy economy that 20 years ago we never would have imagined is the price of natural gas, is fracking, which was, by the way, something that the Department of Energy helped bring, bring to life. Um, argue what you will about fracking. Uh, it, natural gas is one reason why our carbon footprint is lower now than it was 10 years ago. Um, but ha how has the low price of natural gas disrupted what any of you would have said 10 years ago about the future of more renewables and a less carbonized economy? Uh, let me start on that. In, in part, uh, one of my day jobs is to completely reimagine my research portfolio because my research portfolio was in, conceived in a world of abundant coal and dwindling natural gas supplies. Not so much the case these days. Um, but the other flip side of that is the abundant low-cost natural gas, not just here but in many places soon around the world, uh, also means that we're about to lock in a whole generation of gas infrastructure. We're going to build gas-fired power plants. We're going to build gas pipelines, and for the right reasons, we're going to be doing these things. Uh, that actually doesn't get us out of our climate problem. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that uh, uh, I draw a certain amount of joy from is that almost everything that we do in the coal program also has application to natural gas capture. Um, and in fact, if you look at the Venn diagram, the intersection between the technology sets for those two technologies is very large. Um, I view this as just part of the work, now that gas an abundant low-cost gas for a while is, in fact, a market reality, is an underpinning of our energy policy here and in many countries, then we need to be prepared for that from a technology base. And, and in doing so, uh, I'm pleased to say we're busily going about that in my office. Well, I should point out that the, the price of utility-scale solar PV is equivalent or less than natural gas right now in the U.S., and wind is half the cost of natural gas. The cost, the levelized cost without subsidy of wind in the U.S. on average is 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour, and gas is between 6 and 8, same as solar uh, utility PV. So there, this really does encourage more growth of the wind and solar. Natural gas, you can't you have to price it out to actually get to replace 100 percent of it. It has to go up in price or the others have to go down more. Uh, but I just want to point out that it's not, gas is not the cheapest form of electricity. No, but, but it may be per kilowatt hour is, is, is cheaper, but it's not there. I mean, wind and solar are like 4 or 5 percent of the, it's, it's nice yeah. to say that, but it's not there, it's not available. Well, it is, wind is 4 to 5 percent of the U.S. and then in Idaho and South, Iowa and South Dakota it's about 20 to 30 percent. Yeah, but there are parts of the country where it isn't. And the reason why the SAS power people built the plant they have is because they couldn't put up solar and wind and they'd done as much efficiency as they could in their market. That solution was the one that worked for them. It was by far the lowest cost option that they had in their market. And that's illustrative. In parts of the U.S., the renewable resource is quite small. And in those, many of those places, the fossil resource is quite large. And I think it's judicious 
to look broadly today, it is way too early to start cutting out pieces of, of the technology set uh, because all of the technologies get lower in price. All of the technologies have opportunities for disruptive growth and change. And so I think it's both prudent and parsimonious to remain open to all of these options as we move forward. A related, a related question, or if, uh, if I can, and this may be where you're headed, but also there's the question of the grid. I mean, is the grid anywhere near ready to handle a movement, a quick movement, to away from fossil fuels to renewables? Yeah, let me answer that question. Let me, let me just comment on this, this other question. Uh, look, I think it's, it, it's absolutely a windfall opportunity for this nation, for, 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 for the U.S., uh, that we have low-cost natural gas. You don't get low-cost natural gas in Europe right now. You don't get low-cost natural gas in Asia. Uh, and what I fear is that we will squander the opportunity of what people have taught, referred to natural gas as a bridge technology. And so there is a sense of urgency. We need to have an end goal in mind that's not problem solved, we've got natural gas. It, it needs to be one that says, let's take full advantage of what we have, and we are decarbonizing because we're switching primarily from coal to natural gas. However, by 2040, we've got to start getting the carbon out of natural gas, or we never make any of the targets. I'm already very, very pessimistic that we're going to make the targets that we've set for ourselves. So there's, there is a bit of a burning platform that we are not heeding if we don't take advantage of this opportunity for us. Now, relative to the grid, um, what, what I can say is, is that – in the absence of national public policy that's coordinated and aligned, what you get is local um, energy policy that happens down at the grassroots level. It's happening state by state. It's happening due to the local economic development conditions in every region of the country. So that's why you have people in the southeast doing things very, very differently than people in the southwest. And, and, and it's understandable, maybe not ideal, but understandable. And so you've got a lot of opportunity space here that I think is, is really to try to coordinate these things. But, but frankly, we need some leadership. We need some leadership from the top. Uh, but absent that, we're going to get leadership from the local levels. And I think most people are beginning to recognize that decarbonization is a good thing, but they're not doing it w without some level of, of understanding of what the business opportunities are, the investments, and the return on the investments, and the economics. So those are all okay. part of the problem. And, and I know we could talk about natural gas forever, but, but please make it quick because we have a lot of questions. I, I don't want to go to natural gas. I want to go to your grid question. Okay. And as, as we've talked about, there are questions national about, uh, about the grid. But I, I'd like us to think more uh, seriously about what we can do with the distribution system grid. By investments that need to be made in the distribution grid right now, we can make those wisely in a way that becomes far more resilient and it becomes far less wasteful. And I'm going to put a plug in for a workshop that's going to happen tomorrow at 2 o'clock um, about integrated volt VAR control. And that's a, that's a technology. We, we concern ourselves with how do we get to energy efficiency because consumers need to change their behavior. This doesn't require consumers to be, change their behavior. By controlling the voltage that goes to the consumer's location, they can actually reduce the usage in their homes and businesses by somewhere between 1.5% to 3%. Call it 2%. It's massive. That in and of itself is something that we need to seriously consider. And the same type of investments that we make to make that happen will enable us to integrate more smoothly, more smoothly renewables like rooftop solar and will require, um, will enable us to be more resilient when we see the inevitable increase in storms, which knock out our distribution system. So these are smart investments. These aren't additional costs. These are taking investments that need to be made anyway and doing them with some forethought to take into account this vision of the future that we want, a two-way grid. I think the voltage was turned down in my house this morning because it was 53 degrees when I got up. I think the utility did something. When I was asleep, I signed on for it. You know, I said, okay. Okay, uh, this is a good question because, uh, because I was going to ask it. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, whoever wrote this. Uh, um, sh since nuclear has given us about 20% of U.S. energy for over 50 years with no emissions, uh, and China and Russia are moving quickly to expand it, not to mention South Korea and many other countries, why not the U.S. as well? Well, first of all, the emissions are not zero. It's about 9 to 25 times more uh, air pollution and carbon per kilowatt hour than wind energy. Due to, half of it's due to uh, the uranium refining 
uh, that occurs during the lifetime of the nuclear plant. The other is the opportunity cost. It takes between 11 and 19 years to put up a nuclear plant between planning, uh, construction, and operation compared to two to five years or three to five years for a wind and solar farm. So you, in the meantime, you're waste spinning your wheels and letting coal and gas uh, spit out pollution. And so in terms, and the cost is is completely subsidized in the U.S., first of all, but it's a, even that, even with subsidy, it's the cost is so much more than these others. You'll, next time you get up a nuclear plant, you'd have to wait at least 10 to 11 to 19 years, and the Arctic ice will be melted by then. Anybody else? Yeah. No, this is the Chamber of Commerce. Excuse me, right. the Chamber of Commerce out there, not NCSE. <laughs> so a, a couple of things quickly. One, we've run this experiment in California, Japan, and in Germany where you turn off the nuclear power plants, and whenever you do, the emissions go up. Right. And, and Japan? That, oh, yes, absolutely. Japan is, is building rapidly coal and gas, has gone basically, uh, and, and in fact, their balance of trade went from like positive 5 billion to minus 10 billion <laughs> over the past three years because they've gone to importing fuel. Um, we, the other thing is we actually are building nuclear power plants through the loan program office at the Department of Energy. Some people call it a subsidy. We call it a technology investment. You, people can differ on these things rationally. But in fact, we're putting in two big nuclear plants, one of them, for example, in Plant Fogel in Georgia. Um, and part of the reason why is because we want to learn about the technology base, see how, res how reliable it is, what are the opportunities to build, what it really costs for real as opposed to on paper. Uh, all of these things are, are part of what we need to do. Um, but I. I was at a meeting yesterday at the Center for American Progress in which we talked about Fukushima Daiichi in the Japan context. And, and the fact is there the, the safety issues around nuclear are forward in everyone's minds these days. And that will have to be conscienced as we go forward with any nuclear plan. Okay, let's move on to another one here. Uh, I'm going to amend this one slightly by adding something. That the question is, can we decarbonize without a carbon tax? Or, sh I should add, emissions trading of some kind? I mean, I personally, there are, there are many policies that can be put in place, so I'm not tied to a carbon tax, or, but if, if that works, that works. There are so, so many ways to skin a cat. Rarely we are in deep agreement. <laughs> um, there are, in Europe, they're trying everything from feed-in tariffs to policy parity to contract for differences. Um, there are everything from renewable portfolio standards to clean energy portfolio standards. Uh, there's many, many different ways to get there, and, and our country doesn't exactly have a history of carbon taxation as sort of a, or, or, or policy things that look like it. Uh, we seem to do regulation and then figure out the financing afterwards, and, and in that context, there are many, many possible policies. Ellen? And what, whatever policy is put in place, it's what we found uh, through studies and simulations is that if you have the technologies in your back pocket ready to go, you can get a nonlinear bonus above and beyond the, uh, the policy gain. So a policy uh, applied by itself will give you a certain amount of benefit. Uh, a new technology applied by itself will give you a certain amount of benefit. But if you put the two together, a policy and a new technology, you can get substantially more benefits. So making sure that whatever, we don't know what the policy space is going to be like, but making sure that we have ready to go the, uh, the technologies that will allow us to take advantage of those policies and really drive for lo forward with lower carbon is a big part of our preparation. Okay, I have a question from a, a business student at Rutgers University. To Mark, how are you going to pay for all this? <laughs> well, as it, the levelized cost of the energy system, as I mentioned, is about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So when you look at the renewables, the upfront cost, if you want to power the whole U.S., the upfront capital cost is about $15 trillion to convert the whole energy systems. So it sounds like a lot, but so uh, there's higher capital costs with wind, water, solar than with conventional fuels, but you have zero fuel costs. So you're paying, the zero, you're paying fuel costs, and they're rising for all these uh, conventional technologies, or they will rise, I mean, if you look at the long-term trend. But when you look at the levelized cost of energy, it's right now, as I said, wind is half the cost of natural gas, the levelized cost of energy, and solar utility scale is is pair is is in pair parity with the other with uh, natural gas. So over time, all the renewables are coming down, and the average for all the fossil fuels is going up. Although you do have lower petroleum prices now, and you do have drop in natural gas, but you look at the, the trend, they're all going up. So eventually, you stabilize the energy price because once you put up the wind, water, solar system, you have zero fuel cost whereas the other costs are always going to rise. And we should probably point out that energy efficiency is a third of all of those. 
Yeah, well, ener yeah energy efficiency yeah. is even okay. you more want to, beneficial. You want to, no, go ahead. I'll make the point. <laughs> I'll make the point. Uh, you know, I think uh, the, the amount of investment that's required to make this energy transformation uh, is huge, and we recognize that, and it's not going to be done by the government. It's going to be done by the private sector. We, we need the, the, the public policy that we put in place needs to allow markets to work needs to allow investors to get a, a reasonable return on investment, and that will drive the innovation that's required. Part of, our, part of, the, problem, part of the opportunity space that we have is that our system today is so cr incredibly inefficient. We, we waste more than half of the energy content in our supply by the time it's used for some useful purpose. And so if you, you know, it, it, Sometimes, you know, we talk about the levelized energy costs. We tend to talk about it in the context of central station where you're competing against natural gas or coal at some, you know, two or three cents a kilowatt hour, when in fact, by the time it gets to us at the, at the end use point, we're paying six, seven cents, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you can have a technology, which solar will do today at six cents a kilowatt hour, then, then you kind of win at that point just because of all the inefficiencies in the system today. So... Part of the problem has to do with how do we, how do we structure the, the services that we provide, and then who pays is going to be a, a real function of, of, the, of the market conditions that allow technologies to flourish. And I think distributed generation offers you some opportunities there that you presently don't enjoy in a central station type model that's exclusively central station. So this, this hybrid that, that will occur, I think, will be part of unleashing innovation in a way in which the private sector is going to pay for this. It's interesting, and I'd like to ask a question based on that. Three-fifths of this panel are in the federal government, and the, the federal government in the business of trying to create and develop technology that will then be uh, embraced joyfully by the private sector. Uh, give me a grade, A through E, on how well the federal government in the past has transferred tech, developed and transferred technology to the private sector. Well, that's Ellen's. <laughs> a, a through E. There's plenty of technologies that I would give it an A on. So wind, uh, the Department of Energy's investments of wind were seminal and hugely important in the fact that we now have effective wind technologies. Nuclear, whether you like it or not, was uh, incentivized and driven by the federal government. Hydraulic fracturing? Hydraulic fracturing. We did play, Department of Energy and other federal agencies played a significant role in the early stage research in that. Um, we can always do better, but in fact, without that early stage investment, without the bridge over the valley of death, we will not have the new technologies that are going to make it possible for us to meet the goals that we have to meet. So I don't want to do an A through E. I can say that without, without the government intervention at the early stages and at the developmental stages that industry cannot or will not take on on its own because it's too risky, it, uh, their stockholders won't, uh, won't move on it, we wouldn't be where we are today even as we are in our ability to have dreams uh, about decarbonizing the future. Well, so let's, let's, let's push that ball a little farther down the lane. And um, Cheryl, perhaps this is one for you. Um, this question is, in certain parts of the U.S., the utilities are pushing back hard on the requirement, to, a government requirement, to purchase power from photovoltaics on individual homes. But we could enlarge that to say things like renewable portfolio standards. How do we change the conversation on this? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to what I started with. What we want is a platform that these distribution companies are providing to their customers that accurately assess the value of whether it's solar, whether it's demand response, whether it's combined heat and power, um, not only assess the value of what the consumer contributes to the grid, but accurately values the services that this, anim this, this platform grid provides to customers. And customers are going to use it very differently. You know, if I'm living in a condo in Manhattan, it's going to be a very different usage than if you're in a suburb with a four-bedroom house and, you know, 5,000 square feet. We have to slice and dice how we use the system, the platform, and appropriately value that. Consumers pay that, but they also get their fair share back when they contribute to it. Okay. Anybody else? Um, 
Go ahead. Uh, sorry, just super quickly. Uh, a lot of the deployment that's happened in the renewable space has been enabled by renewable portfolio standards, and that allows people to get recovery into the rate base for these technologies. Um, only one state that I know of, the state of Illinois, has a clean energy portfolio standard, which actually allows for additional energy sources to come in. So if we're seeing here saying, you know, no low carbon megawatt left behind, if that's sort of the idea, mm -hmm. um, that's just another avenue for experimentation by states. And Secretary, uh, uh, former Secretary of State George Schultz and Jeff Bingham, and sent, former senator, now at Stanford University, wrote an interesting little book called the, the, uh, the State Cookbook, in which they lay out policy options that state have pursued for renewable and efficiency. And uh, this, this, to me, looks like an interesting place to start. Okay, so let's, let's take a, Mark, did you want to add to that? Let's take a, a little turn here, and we've got a couple time for uh, one or two more. How will the current low price of oil affect the investment in renewables and natural gas? Well, I mean, oil is, is primarily for transportation, whereas like wind and solar are mostly electricity, but then you get into competition with like electric cars, so that's probably where, but I think you know, people, once they realize that an electric car is four to five times more efficient, I mean, if somebody buys an electric car, even if it costs more, they're going to save $20,000 uh, over 15 years uh, because of the efficiency of electricity over internal combustion. If, if, you, if you drive 15 years, 15,000 miles a year, you'll save $20,000 in fuel cost based on $4 a gallon price of gasoline versus uh, 80 cents a gallon for electricity. So even if it goes down to $3, you're still going to save a lot of money. So it's, they're so much more efficient. The electric cars... Are uh, break down less. Some of them are really safe now. Some of the, one of the safest cars in the world is a Tesla Model S. Um, I don't think you're going to stop people from buying electric cars, but I think you it does slow things down certainly. Um, on the other hand, it does hurt uh, what's it the Canadian tar sands oil and the fracking because those both are are less competitive with lower price of oil. So it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. I think there's one thing that we have to constantly reinforce in our memory and in these discussions, which is that while the price of oil is low right now, it's not going to stay low. In my lifetime, I've seen it going up and down and up and down at least three times. I sat in gas lines in the 70s when we had rationing uh, because of the, the uh, crisis in the Middle East. So I think one of the things that we really have to constantly reemphasize is how uncertain those energy uh, sources are, our dependence on that oil. And keep in mind that we have to stabilize our continuing investment to maintain uh, our ability to meet future higher, uh, a world with future higher oil prices and our need to decarbonize. Uh, the only thing I want to add to this is that the uh, landscape in which that question will be answered is China. Um, and uh, the rate of clean transportation option deployment in China uh, will, in fact, respond to the low oil prices. It's part of how they think about these things in a very real way. Uh, I'd say the court is out, and we'll have to see. And that reminds me of a question that, I, that I'd like to ask, and there were two or three that were along the same lines here. You know, whether it is natural development of natural gas or nuclear power or in renewables, uh, full-scale, you know, 100 percent of our time, um, in a sense, the United States is something of a model for the rest of the world, and it's particularly at a time when the rest of the world, much of it is headed toward a very dangerous direction in terms of emissions. And so uh, to what extent do you think the U.S. Should, should keep that in mind as it develops its future course in renewables or a mix of all of the above or whatever, not only in what we need to help the planet, but what we can influence in the behavior of others? Uh, let me take a, a very short stab at this. One of the things I've learned in the federal government is that we don't make policy in other countries. Um, it, it's an unfortunate fact for some, but in point of fact, it, it's simply the case. We don't make policy in other countries. Um, by leading in technology, that enables competitiveness for U.S. companies, we think is very important. But I should also say that there are plenty of countries doing very deep innovation, not just in the policy space, but in the technology space as well. It's very important for America to actually stay in front, and that requires investment in the next generation of technology development and the companies that will bring it to market. Yeah, let me just piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, so I, because, because of, I think, what Tahulio just said, I, one of the things that I try to do is try to keep a, an eye on what's going on in the rest of the world. I'm on a board in Singapore. I'm on a board in, in Dubai. 
And from both of those perspectives, what I can tell you is a uh, very complex set of, of, of dynamics in play in the energy world, and specifically as it relates to geopolitics. Uh, recently, there was a, a fairly major uh, agreement between China and Russia on delivering natural gas for 30 years, half a trillion dollars of investment, uh, a major change in the way in which they will uh, uh, react and engage politically, as well as from the, on, the, on the economic side. These are matters of national security. These are matters of U.S. interests being promoted by the fact that we've got alternatives and that we can, that we can take a leadership role uh, in, in, the, in the geopolitics of a lot of things that relate to energy, which is uh, very, very front and, and, and in the mind of most of the countries, both in Asia, especially in, in, the, in the emerging economies. But very soon, that will be in Africa and that will be in South America. So these are areas that uh, I think we need to be in, in, in a position to offer them solutions that uh, are better than other options that they have. Well, that's a hopeful way to end it. Mark, quickly, we've got about 30 seconds left. Well, the world will eventually switch entirely to wind, water, and solar. It's just a question of when. So the U.S. can either be a leader or a follower in this problem. And right now it is a leader, and although other countries are, are really catching up and some are actually ahead. Uh, but it, you know, it saves lives. 3.2% 3 of the GDP of the U.S. and similarly the rest of the world. People realize that you're going to have these huge benefits worldwide by doing this conversion. And so it's really silly for people not to do it. And so I think people are realizing this slowly. Thank you so much. Thank all of you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you guys and everybody who's...